Hans Van Sommeren is director of the Great Lakes Water Studies Institute at Northwestern Michigan College in Traverse City, Michigan. While at NMC, he has collaboratively developed several new initiatives in water-related research and education, including associate degrees in both freshwater studies and marine technology, which is a Bachelor of Science degree in marine technology. Uh, offshore ROV pilot training credential and an associate degree in survey. Hans has also created and numerous other professional development opportunities for the marine industry as part of the Marine Center. Prior to Northwestern Michigan College, Hans worked at the University of Michigan in the Ocean Engineering Laboratory and the Marine Hydrodynamics Laboratories. Hans is the Marine Technology Society Great Lakes Section Chair and is also a trustee at large with the Hydrographic Society of America. Both international societies supporting the sustainable understanding of both the world ocean and the Great Lakes. Hans completed a BSE and MSE in Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering from the University of Michigan and is a chartered marine technologist with the Marine Technology Society and Society of Underwater Technology. So without further ado, Hans Van Summeren. Great, thanks everybody. And, and I, it's great to be here. Um, certainly I would say it's great to be here. My dad was able to come and this is uh, now the second time he's been able to, to be here and see me speak, so I'm excited about that. But today's talk is about uh, NMC, NMC focus, NMC's role in what I'm calling the new blue economy. And I'll get into the definition of that, but really these are opportunities for the Great Lakes. These are opportunities for how the Great Lakes will be here for thousands of years yet to come. And it's built around, well, I'll get it last time. So I guess I was here about seven years ago. And just to give a preamble to today, uh, that talk was before we had some of the degrees that Jeff mentioned and some of the opportunities that we've been creating. But the, the outcome of that talk and the idea that technology and data are the drivers for where we're headed, that has not changed. And I put one slide up, a picture from the last talk, and that is the Panama Canal. And at the time, the Panama Canal was going to be doubling. Well, it's now doubled, and that presents some other challenges that I'll talk about in today's uh, discussion. So new blue economy, what is it? And it's really the old blue economy, or the current blue economy, but from a sustainable approach. So it's less carbon-based and more looking at innovative approaches to technology and the development of the talent to support that technology. So it's a big change. We're seeing migration from enormous uh, 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 infrastructure to stuff that's smarter, that's smaller, that's more adaptable, that uh, is able to work in different environments quicker and cleaner and faster. So the blue economy, as you may know it, involves fisheries, involves maritime trade, involves water quality and the understanding of the water bodies throughout the world. Um, and now the new blue economy is really building on some of the gaps that have been recognized with the current blue economy structure. So how does NMC fit in? And, and Jeff had explained some of these, but if you look at the progression of things that NMC offers, it's pretty impressive. Our role in water began with freshwater studies in 2008. Marine technology started in 2012, our bachelor's degree in 2015, and Marine Center 2018. International collaborations uh, just finished this year of 152 degrees that we've awarded to uh, a school in China in our marine technology area. We've also done that on the construction technology side. But the idea that what we do here has value on the other side of the world, and so much so that they've emulated our program to maintain the needs of that country and still have us involved in teaching over there. So, Pretty important stuff. We have a lot of international uh, professional societies that we play lead roles in, and that's for the development of conferences and awareness of Great Lakes. When I first started going to conferences that were typically ocean-related, the, the conversations were always about the ocean. And if you raise your hand, or I would, about the Great Lakes, oh, yeah, of course, the Great Lakes are included. Well, were they? Were they really the highlight of this conversation? Were we just a small pond in the Midwest? 
Um, university partnerships, uh, for years we've had good partnerships with Western Michigan University uh, in water. We have a newer one with Lake Superior State and fisheries. Uh, we've had long-standing relationships with Michigan Tech on the water side, as well as many other programs at the college. Um, so there's a lot of university strength in terms of how we can incorporate water and marine training with programs that are already out there. And then while I'm not speaking towards the Maritime Academy, we have three bachelor's degrees as part of our Maritime Academy, which are very powerful degrees leading towards immediate employment throughout the country, throughout the world. And so one of the things that I hear and that is, is, is something that I want to stress is that NMC has its own bachelor's degrees, one in marine technology, the Great Lakes Maritime Academy has three. Those are done completely in Traverse City, all from NMC, and all of those lead to basically 100% employment of every person who goes through. So pretty powerful stuff that we do right now. Um, when you think about what it is and where we're headed, you know, data is the driver. Data is a huge driver towards understanding the world and being connected to the world. And if we think of water, um, put perspective, NOAA generates over 10 terabytes of data a day. Uh, and that's just sensors and things out in the ocean, out in the Great Lakes, collecting information. But do we use 10 terabytes of data? Do we have access to it? Does anyone who wants to understand something in a particular part of the world know how to get to it? Those are the big gaps right now, and a lot of that has to do with connectivity. So Starlink, Elon Musk putting up thousands of satellites that will allow the globe to connect better and allow some of these opportunities to exist. And that, that will then lead towards those 10 terabytes and all the other information that's out there getting in the hands of the people who need it for decision making. And if you think about it from where we are today, and I'm going to really expand on this, but the Great Lakes and the World Ocean are very data sparse. In fact, you may be surprised if you haven't heard this, how little we know about each of these, these entities. So um, you think about it, if we could get to the best space possible, we'd be managing our water assets at scale and in real time. And that's a big ask, but it can be done, and I think that's where we're headed. So the ocean, 71% of the planet uh, is covered by it. If you look at it from an employment standpoint, it is the world's largest employer, three plus billion people. Uh, food for 2.6 plus billion people on the planet, about a third of the planet. Um, the economy, if it was the total GDP of the world, would be about 5%. So significant contributor, it's the lungs of the earth. Only 20% is the map at high resolution. So. When I say high resolution, I mean we couldn't see Traverse City on the bottom of the ocean because of the sparseness of the data. We, when we look for things in particular areas, sometimes we find one kilometer high mountains on the bottom of the lake that didn't exist in any chart. So when I say sparse and unknown, it's, it's really unknown. When we go to the Great Lakes, though, 20% of the world ocean, you know, we're only we're less than 15% in the Great Lakes. And so those of you who fish, use charts and seen that, you, you certainly thought you're looking at very high resolution data. You're looking at all kinds of information on the bottom of the lakes when in fact it's less than 15 percent. And if we use parallel numbering systems like we did in the ocean, we got 40 plus million people drinking the water. We have a seven billion dollar annual fisheries which may even be a little higher. I think those, the date, that's a little outdated. Six trillion dollar GDP for the U.S. and Canada around the Great Lakes, 1.3 million jobs, and 7,000 kilometers plus of coastline. So more than the eastern seaboard and the Gulf Coast put together. And so when you think about the challenges that the world ocean and all the countries that are on on coastline are experiences, so are the Great Lakes. And and that is really the need for what we've been really pushing for in terms of a better understanding. We know more about Mars, we know more about Venus, we know more about our own moon than we do the Great Lakes. We even know more, I guess, when you say about the ocean than we do our Great Lakes. And so what we've been trying to build out is the change, trying to make this become more of a reality. And it started with Seabed 2030. Seabed 2030 is uh, basically trying to map the world ocean in the next decade. By 2030, it was funded by uh, the Nippon Foundation. Get this rolling. Uh, the, the general bathymetric chart of the ocean is the idea to collect all this information 
and make it freely available so we can make decision making and policy decisions with, with information. Um, the seabed motto is empowering the world to make policy decisions, use the ocean sustainably, undertake scientific research, which is informed by a detailed understanding of the world ocean. And so when I first heard a talk on this, it was at a conference in New Orleans, and the idea the speaker was presenting is how little we knew and providing examples of what good data versus what we what we currently have, what, what that really looks like and what we can find out. And, and afterward, I spoke to the speaker about where are the Great Lakes in this? And this is where one of those conversations comes in with the idea that, well, the Great Lakes are part of this, but, but were they? And, and so from this conversation, we coined and, and really started to develop the Lake Bed 2030 approach. And the whole idea was it was the same as seabed, but it was focused on the Great Lakes. And the idea that it wasn't just the bottom of the Great Lakes, it's everything. It's the entire water column. It's the what's in the seabed. It's the habitat that it supports, the fisheries that live in it. All this information is, is widely misunderstood and is not collected at any level. And so when you think about it, the Great Lakes were almost um, at a higher priority than a lot of the world ocean. And so data sparseness and depths of the Great Lakes, this is just a, a basic graphic of how little is really out there in particular areas of the Great Lakes and how much yet we have to cover. And so Lake Bed started with a conference. It was a conference that um, we pitched to the Marine Technology Society and we called it a, a tech surge, the idea of bringing people together, collaborating on the use of smarter technology with collaborative approaches to map the Great Lakes. And the idea was that this needed a bigger audience. This needed to go outside of the Great Lakes and bring in some of the partners that we have throughout the country. And so not only did MTS buy into that, but it really catalyzed the, the whole idea of, of us uh, getting this rolling at a bigger, bigger level. And so that's led to multiple conferences, multiple uh, connections with uh, partnerships throughout the United States and Canada. All the big players, the NOAA, the USGS, uh, the Canadian Fisheries, uh, the uh, Department of Ocean Fisheries, the, the idea that many people wanted to sign up and be part of this was important. And so we've had a series of conferences, multiple different venues, and we're seeing 400, 500 people sign up for these conferences now, which means the message is getting out that people care and want to do this kind of understanding. And what I'm excited about, and, and whether you've heard of this conference or not, this has led towards us hosting the, the Global Oceans Conference in Chicago in 2020, 2020, uh, 2025. And I'll be the conference chair for that. I pitched that idea, but the, this has never been held in any freshwater body in the world. It's never been held, obviously, in the Great Lakes. And for them to bring the world to the Great Lakes is really going to be an opportunity. And this will be an opportunity for everyone in the Great Lakes to really showcase what they're doing, to showcase the power the Great Lakes bring to the international community, but also the needs that we share with the ocean community. So that's a big deal. 2025 in Chicago, um, I think that's something that you'll hear more and more about as we start the planning process now. So all this stuff, you know, why do we need it? What, what is the value of having this information? And this is a slide that the Seabed Initiative had used over the years, and the idea of, of invasive species and modeling and weather events and, and coastal erosion are not just ocean uh, issues. I'm sure many of you faced coastal erosion issues over the last couple of years, and many might have spent a lot of money or were on the fringe of whether I should spend that money. Lakes have gone down now, but will they come back? Of course they will. And so without detailed information, we can't predict the changes of the coastline. We can't predict changes in fisheries. We need to understand this information. We have opportunities for smart shipping and the ability to use the Great Lakes differently, looking at it from a very productive standpoint, but a sustainable standpoint. And so lots of examples I'll present now about why this stuff really matters and what it means. Uh, I'm going to start with, with this guy. So fisheries management is a huge piece of the Great Lakes, our, our economy and supporting science around it. So 
This image is taken from East Grand Traverse Bay. It's in about 620 feet of water. And this was taken March 16th this year. We had a very calm day. We were able to go out on a tribal fishing tug and, and dive one of our, our subs down to the bottom. And I was out with a, with a researcher from uh, an emeritus researcher, Dave Jude, who was the first person who discovered round goby in the Great Lakes, which have decimated a lot of our, our habitat. So Dave has been looking for this guy, the deepwater sculpin. And the deepwater sculpin is important because it represents a critical prey fish for lake trout. In fact, it's, the, it's maybe the biggest driver of the food chain for lake trout. So what's unique about this is that these fish spawn in the middle of winter and in very deep water. And for almost six years, we've been working with Dave trying to see this. And we've gone out at different times. It depends on weather, of course, but last, last year was a pretty calm and, and uh, I'll say quiet winter and the lake was not frozen. So we went out and on the very last dive of, and the end of the very last dive, we were driving around and we came across this picture. So this is a, a male deep water sculpin guarding a sack of eggs. Now, doesn't look like much. This happens with other fish species all the time. This has never been seen before. This has never been documented. No one knew the process. No one knew how they inhabited these, these little nests that create. And a lot of that is because we don't know where to look. You cannot send an ROV down to the bottom and just drive around and find these things. You have to have some, some information on the detailed bathymetry and what it looks like. And so this little foot divot in the bottom can show up with some of the mapping that we can do. Knowing this then helps us understand fish stock and understand where maybe some either needs are or some, some uh, problems exist. And so this was a, a, you know, I get to see a lot of really neat things underwater and a lot of things that are really deep. And this is probably one of the most profound things I've ever got a chance to see. And it's just a three inch long fish with a sack of eggs that are about the size of a golf ball. So why do we even care about that? Well, round goby, which is an invasive fish that was introduced in the lakes in the early 90s, uh, are, are, are basically taking over a lot of the, the base of the food chain. And round goby, if you've snorkeled or swam, you know, they look like this, they hang out on the bottom. They represent a pretty big chunk of what is considered uh, the, the lower end of the food chain in the biomass. These guys eat those eggs. And so when we were down there, it wasn't, say, 10 feet away from where we found that egg sac. There were goby hanging out, and they were hanging out deep. And again, the deepest a goby had ever been seen in the Great Lakes. And so did that fish nest survive? Did those eggs survive? We don't know. But the idea that we just don't know so much about the bottom of the lake is, is where all this plays up. And so deep water sculpin represent a pretty big piece of the biomass. Around goby, they, in this chart, they say is less. And it, it's interesting because the, the way they estimate fish in the Great Lakes is they run a net, a trawl net across the bottom and they drag and then they count the fish and weigh them. And what's happening is you see these fish hang out on the bottom of the lake so they're not up in the water column. The net goes right over the top of them. And so there was a, a new piece of technology being used that was mapping the amount of round goby in Good Harbor Reef out in Good Harbor Bay at Sleeping Bear Dunes. And they estimated, based on their calculations, that 20% of all of Lake Michigan's round goby were on that reef, which is uh, obviously not the case. It just means that we're underestimating the global mass or the lake-wide mass, which means our fisheries predictions are off, which means we're not doing a good job at managing our fisheries. Again, a $7 billion industry that drives a lot of what's going on. The other thing are, are the shipwrecks and the influence of quagga mussels and zebra mussels and so on. So this is a, a shipwreck in Lake Huron, pre-mussel 1996. Mussels were in the lakes at that time, but they weren't in Lake Huron at this depth. You can see this is a cargo ship. It's got an ornate figurehead on its bow, um, very easily seen. This is a shipwreck, not the same one, but in Lake Huron near that area just last year. And all this growth came in the last 20 years. And so now all the detail, all the features of these shipwrecks are gone. And they will never be back unless the mussel colonies somehow die off, which is, which is probably not likely. 
lakes are home to thousands of shipwrecks. And I know we got a lot of people who do a lot of that work over there. Thousands of wonderful pieces of history that are being essentially um, taken away from us in terms of analysis and understanding. So nautical charting, the ability to have ships move through the Great Lakes. We transport a lot of cargo in the Great Lakes. And so this is an example of what a high resolution survey looks like. This is the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, we have the Mackinac Bridge right here. We have the Enbridge pipeline right here. We have this very unique river that goes through the bottom of the lake that connected the lakes about 9,000 years ago. This type of information, again, only exists in less than 15% of the lakes. But what you get out of this is not only just, all right, ships can safely traverse this area or we know where they should traverse, but we also find a lot of other information about the archaeology and the shipwrecks and the history of the lakes. We also do better at predicting modeling. And that's probably the biggest gap. The predictive models are very good for circulation and how things would, would move through the lakes, but they don't have this kind of information. And so the modeling teams at Michigan Tech and so on, they can't, they can't do what they really want to do without this type of information. But what do you see on the bottom when you find it? And these are, these are sonar images of the shipwrecks that were in that, uh, in that area. And so we're using information that allows us to find very detailed measurements and features of the various shipwrecks. Many of these are known. In fact, maybe some of you have, have dove on these or done imaging on them. But this one, this crane barge, and you can see the, the crane arm on the, um, on the barge itself, that was unknown, and that was in the middle of the shipping lane. It was only about 45 feet underwater. And so the idea that ships were traversing over that and perhaps eventually maybe hitting it could be a, 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 a terrible uh, tragedy for the lakes. And so um, E-Track is a company that's from San Francisco. E-Track has endowed a scholarship at NMC because of the products we put out. They want to hire our students. So not only did they just come and ask to hire or interview, they gave us $15,000 and they've endowed a scholarship over the years. And so money talks, obviously, but the idea that someone in San Francisco can't find the talent they need unless they come to Traverse City speaks a lot about our programming. And so this leads into the smart ships. And these were just some, some uh, uh, articles that came out just a, a couple of days ago. And Marguerite and the Maritime Executive, so uh, yeah. But uh, big players in the shipping industry are, are skipping Seattle. They're, they're no longer bringing their ships into Seattle because of these log jams and these ports. It's not worth the disruption to their supply chain. So now these transports are skipping ports and at the same time, the leaders of those companies are calling for decarbonization of the shipping fleet, the, the fleet that they own. They want zero emission capable or zero emission vessels in the next 20 or 30 years, which is fast. And if you think about how that's gonna change with the way we're building and investments are gonna occur, that's a, that's a lot of, that's a big deal. And then also the supply chain. Some of the big issues that we've been having with these these gaps are we just can't move the product from the port to the to the final destination. So they're really looking at this from a broader perspective, but making the shipping fleet autonomous and smart and, and, and low or no carbon is a big deal. And you don't need to think back too far if you go back to the Ever Given and blocking the Suez Canal and we shut the world down for a short period of time. At least we shut a lot of the supply chains down because of one ship going sideways in a canal. And so the scales of that Panama Canal that allow ships like this to transit much more efficiently are also part of the problem. These macro size or these giant sized ships and these efficiencies they bring also can create some of the biggest blockages and, and, and uh, 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 impacts to, to the supply chain. So how are we gonna fix that? And I think the, the big thing here is smart ships and if we had better understanding of the lake if we had better uh, buoy presence throughout the lakes meaning we can understand meteorologic and oceanographic events as we we look at the lakes and the oceans we can better come up with ways to create autonomous shipping fleets and a good partner of ours at the college from the marine side and the maritime side is Kongsberg a Norwegian company 
they're developing these solutions now where the pilot station for this ship is somewhere in someone's office and that ship piloting station could be in multiple parts of the world so this continuous operation means that someone's working nine to five in somewhere some part of the world every day controlling the same ship and so by doing this, by understanding more data, we can do this safely. We can, we can minimize the impact of these congestions occurring because we can predict where things are going to be better. Um, smart shipping and short sea shipping are opportunities where we can move cargo much easier. We do that on the East Coast. We do that in some other countries. We could do that in the Great Lakes so we're not reliant on these mega freighters doing all the transit. And this was something the Canadian Hydrographic Services Director spoke about in one of the lake bed conferences just a few weeks ago and she said that you know these are the opportunities that Canadians are looking at because it's their ports that are also being impacted by this lack of understanding so how are we going to do that and what will the technology do and so these are just some examples and these are some examples of what we do at NMC so this this buoy uh, is made by a company in in California it's called SOFAR and the, the buoy itself, it, 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 there's nothing special about it, but it's, it's the first low-cost buoy that's been widely distributed that can go out and do all the measurements that we used to put $100,000 buoys out in the lakes to do these measurements. These are under $10,000. And not only that, but they're simple to deploy. They're a single-person deployment, and they have all the algorithms on board to predict all the circulations and wave events and wind events. So you don't need all these other devices on them they can also drift freely so when we have issues with modeling and movements in the in the lake that we need to further understand a, a Coast Guard helicopter could just drop one of these in the lake and let it do its work and help inform either emergency response or spill response to what's going on other things are just autonomous uncrewed where vessels can go out and map and collect information water quality fish surveys, bottom surveys, but the idea we don't need large ships, like the size of our state of Michigan with the Maritime Academy, you don't need a ship that size anymore. You can put nobody out there and run these, these vessels 24 hours a day and collect very good information. Right now, there's no regulation, but there will be soon in that they may still require a certified pilot. And so this is where our Maritime Academies come in with the training of the merchant marine officer may not be on a ship, they may be in someone's office somewhere, but they're doing the same things. The credentials still have value. So a lot of new technology coming out on the surface and then also underwater. And if you've heard Ocean Infinity, this is a, a group, they did a lot of the MH370, the Malaysian aircraft that, that went down six years ago in the South Pacific. They used a fleet of autonomous surface vessels, but also underwater vessels that could go underwater for a week at a time and map at high resolution broad areas of the bottom. These types of products are going to be more commonplace. There are multiple companies that are building these and they're building them for essentially residency underwater that they can live there for two months. So huge opportunity for new technology and supporting these devices, the battery technology, the communications that they use, the devices that they put on board, these are where the drivers of the ocean economy and the Great Lakes economy are really going to change in terms of technology. And then wanted to point this one out that you've read about uh, Saildrome. You know, phenomenal product that is really revolutionizing the way we map. Wind-driven, solar-powered, carbon-neutral, um, mapping the world's oceans. And so just a week ago, they received uh, $100 million in Series C funding. And this was only two months after they proved they actually worked. They don't sell these things, they provide a service. And what I think is unique about that investment, they're providing a service that none of us get a tangible benefit from in terms of it's not uh, a better uh, food item, it's not a better, it's data that supports the understanding of the world ocean and the Great Lakes. And it also didn't hurt that they drove into one of the hurricanes and they were able to continue mapping in 50-foot waves and 100-knot winds without a hiccup. And so now these are out running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, they completed a mission where they went from Honolulu to Los Angeles 
In 60 days, they map the equivalent of, of Lake Michigan. And they use 400 liters of fuel. So they, use, they have a generator on board just in case the sun doesn't shine. So 400 liters for 60 days, so about 100 gallons. And something like the state of Michigan uses 100 gallons in about an hour. So when you start to put perspective on that, the ability for these things to do mapping, and they're really not that expensive, is pretty impressive. And what they can work in is really impressive. So um, some huge opportunities. We're trying to get them in the Great Lakes now. We were working on an appropriation late in the game last year, but getting $10 million approved so that we could bring these into the Great Lakes and really start to do some mapping. We're going to work on that again next year, but this stuff is really where we're headed and where things are going to be going. Um, and then I'll bring up one last feature here in that if you've heard of seabed mining, the idea of, of deep ocean mining for uh, uh, minerals, manganese, cobalt, nickel, rare earth magnets, stuff that is de being depleted on land. The ocean floor has significant amounts of this, but we don't have a good way to extract it. But what's nice is that this is being looked at, not like oil and gas was 50, 60 years ago, but from a sustainable standpoint. There are the laws of the ocean or the law of the sea, which is looking at this from an environmental perspective and how it's going to be done and how it's going to be done both sustainably but also environmentally supportive of, of the ocean uh, long term. And so there's going to be more of this going on. Uh, I, this is not a Great Lakes activity, but certainly it's something that will affect our technology industries moving forward. And it really is, it is happening fast. So opportunities. And I, I look at this. Um, you know, data really drives all these solutions, and, and we're getting better at it, and we're going to need more of it. You know, Michigan being a leader, I think we have the, the, the brain power throughout our programs and, and uh, organizations throughout the Great Lakes to be a leader in the new blue economy. You know, maybe it's, it's not the Rust Belt, we're the Blue Belt now. Um, job creation, technology development. I even will shout out to our group of students from our program who are now in town and have hybrid robotics, which is a uh, uh, an aerial device that lands on water and deploys systems underwater. They've grown from a class project, a 200 level class project, into uh, they've really got customers all over the world now. They're selling systems and they're turning their product into viable options for multiple different industries and they're right here in town. So I see lots of opportunity for that and then really building the workforce of today and tomorrow and that uh, NMC is doing a fantastic job with that. And we see, again, we see 100% employment of our students coming out of that bachelor's program. And what I like is those graduates are now coming back and they're, they're interviewing and they're, they're recruiting our own students so that organic growth, that peer-to-peer -peer recruitment is really exciting. So, and with that, I'll say thanks. And I want to say thanks to two people who I knew would be here. So Marguerite and Vicki, who are both retiring from the college at the end of the year. I knew I would never get this chance to say that other than here, so uh, in a public audience. So thank you both. But uh, thanks, everybody. And, and I'm happy to take questions. Kenner. Anyone measuring the extent to which the Great Lakes and the oceans contribute to the oxygen in the atmosphere? Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the so yeah, the the how much the Great Lakes and the oceans are contributing um, oxygen to the atmosphere. And, and the whole carbon cycle of the lakes and the ocean is, is probably some of the biggest research that's going on right now. So it's not so much the contribution of the oxygen, it's, it's the sequestration of carbon and, and its ability to absorb to help cleanse, cleanse the air. So yeah, absolutely. That whole ocean lake surface chemistry is, is part of the need for these data because we don't have anything but spot checks here and there. So yeah, it's a huge piece, absolutely. Is China doing some sea dead mining? They are. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, I, and, and, and you don't read about it as much. Um, they have signed on to the law of the sea. The U.S. had not. But I think that's changing now under under the new administration. Um, but uh, I'm 
I'm, they're doing a lot of land building offshore, and so as part of that, I'm, it's, it's inevitable that they're going to be doing some mining. So, okay. Whose responsibility is it to map the Great Lakes? Well, that's, a, that's probably the big, the big conundrum here, yeah. So there is no one responsible party. So uh, we've done estimates, uh, economic estimates on it. It would cost about $200 million dollars to bring in the necessary tools and time to map the Great Lakes in their entirety. So not a lot of money for something as important as that. And, and that's even a high estimate based on some of these newer developments and products. So no one agency does the control of that uh, because we have state jurisdiction and then we have different needs for that. But it's really, that's where the collaboration is probably the most important because just like the ocean, once you get off your your, your continental boundary, whose is it at that point? And why does anyone want to invest in someone else's mapping? So that's where these initiatives, I think, are being the strongest supporter of, we just got to do this and we got to get the right people involved. So it's a, it is a tough one. Yeah? Uh, from the overall NMC perspective, uh, what kind of metrics are you targeted to meet you know, to, to support NMC's long-term goals? I mean, uh, the number of students or well, the, the, the programming, the academic programming, the enrollment in those programs, and then obviously the tuition they bring in supporting the revenue of the college is, is, a, is a key piece. So um, we've got to have programming that can generate revenues that help support the college. Our bachelor's program, because it has a differentiated tuition, it brings in a lot more opportunity for generating additional revenues for areas that don't historically um, have that opportunity. And so, so that's probably a big one. Um, we're looking at what we've done academically and we've moved it into professional training. So we've created a, another arm to the college, the Marine Center, which takes academic work but puts it in a professional realm. So now we're able to price and model programming for professionals in the market which brings another revenue, and that's a big piece of what we do. And then lastly, the, I, I believe that probably the third one is, is most um, dealing with the, 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 the collaborative piece of how we operate within the Great Lakes, that the partnerships and the collaborations and the research we do is absolutely critical for supporting the first two programs and I think meeting the mission of the college in terms of supporting the Great Lakes, why the Institute was founded in the beginning. Data. Are you focusing on forever chemicals at all in connection with your, your testing for PFAS? We don't, we don't do any chemical testing with this. Again, not that it's not part of it, but the whole idea of putting smart sensors that can test for these products in the areas they need to or as part of it. And that's maybe the bigger question with, with all of the collaborators is making sure we, we collect or we map once, but it can be used many times. So. Um, PFAS obviously is becoming a much broader and bigger conversation across everything and so um, the sensor package is required to do that the type of analysis can it work on some of the systems that we're putting out would be would be the next question can someone develop something that can help us do that at a larger scale yeah yes indigenous people in the area do they embrace your work reject it or it's totally neutral so the um, I think embrace would be the best way to describe that. And, and when we looked at that fish, uh, the, the sculpin in the nest, that was aboard a tribal fishing tug and we presented to the uh, Grand Travers Band uh, tribal board on that activity and the support between the, uh, all the entities involved. And so fisheries obviously is a huge piece to uh, uh, what, what the tribe does. And so absolutely from that perspective, from the mapping perspective, I think, again, that sustainability piece um, is important for fisheries long term to understand that. Probably the one thing that is, is the most, uh, would be more controversial is, is the, the historical findings and uh, um, some of the early settlements and the understanding of what's being shown on the bottom of the lake. And, and some of those shipwrecks and that, that data from the uh, uh, Straits of Mackinac, uh, that has been, uh, quarantined because of some of those concerns, not just from uh, tribal members, but also from just other uh, entities. So there is some that 
the, the bottom of the lakes, they don't, not everyone wants to be known uh, at the most detailed level. So a blend of those, yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you elaborate on your relationship to NMC and the Great Lakes Maritime Academy relationship to NMC and then your relationship to the Great Lakes Maritime Academy? Sure, yeah. How, so, is, that, how is that managed? Is it, is it a smooth? So, so, we're, so there's two, um, we're two separate divisions or two separate areas. Um, so the Great Lakes Water Studies Institute is uh, a, academic area it's uh, um, it's a lot of different things in terms of the college so when I first started we didn't have academic programming so we sort of moved into being an academic provider to college opportunities um, our role is is um, you know looking at perspectives of just our strategic direction around water and the roles that we can play in community partnerships and building uh, early on the Institute was known for uh, creating those collaborative partnerships towards looking at things like the Borden River dams and the disposition of those dams and so on. So the Institute does a lot of different things in terms of our role to the college from the academic to the, the professional degree or professional training, uh, research and so on. So there's, there's quite a few different components that we work with. Maritime Academy is another division of the college and supported federally by the Marine Administration. Um, so they operate under their own uh, area of rules and needs in terms of producing cadets that have the credentials for both Great Lakes and, and ocean um, uh, licensure. So they operate in that perspective. And then in terms of together, and I was talking to Kathleen about it here just before the talk, the idea that are there synergies that could develop? And there could be. Um, whenever we have our mapping conferences and we see people from NOAA and the Office of Coast Survey come in, and they point to the state of Michigan. And they're like, "What are you going to do with that?" And I'm like, "It's, it's I don't have control of that." So, um, but that would be a great ship because of all the work it does mapping. But that's not something that can just occur. That needs that Marad approach. And so, um, but there are cadets who are interested in research and working in areas of science. We have conversations with them all the time. A lot of the cadets uh, in the maritime program take one or two of of the marine technology courses just so they get that flavor of science and, and research that we do. So um, in terms of the students in the academy, we, we have great relationships with them. We work in recruiting. We uh, Not every student wants to be on a ship their entire life, and not every student wants to do the research side. So sometimes we get miscategorized with students, and when we do, we, we exchange you know the, the program information and get the student in the right spot. So. So a lot of different ways, but there's there's no hard line between any programming. I think a lot of it has to do with just how we how we have to focus on the needs of our, our students and our programs. Yeah. So uh, in addition to the government funding, are you doing some partnerships with the private sector, like both financially and then trying to grow Traverse City into the center of this blue economy? Well, public-private partnerships have been key since we started. You know, when we first started, we had uh, a research vessel that was sitting on the pier that didn't work. And so um, we were able to get some funding to make that a viable product for us to do work. We didn't have any of this equipment. We had partners in Norway. We had partners in the East Coast and the West Coast who gave us equipment. And so there wasn't an exchange of dollars, but there was an exchange of, of very expensive equipment and people, and so um, that's been that's been key to, to making that work. So, could we be the center of all this? We could, but we'll be a partner in, in many people being the center of this. And it's not it really isn't just one entity. We wouldn't have the capacity to be all that. And so, the Great Lakes Observing System, which is the regional node for the Integrated Ocean Observing System for the Great Lakes, they're really the repository of the data partnerships with sail drone and trying to get them to come into the Great Lakes. Whether we lead that or we lead it with a consortium, that then creates the data that goes into that repository that people have access to. And so um, this this whole lake bed is really an initiative across multiple organizations. And it would be hard for any one 
I mean, anybody to take claim to just have the only component of that. So it has to be a partnership. Yep. On our end, as the general public, what do we do to help support your different initiatives and be involved? Well, I think, uh, you know, making, making people aware of what, what we offer, you know, in terms of um, we need more students. Uh, and I don't mean it just from a general sense, but students who are interested in ocean and Great Lakes careers, we have a lot of options for them. And I don't know that everyone understands that at the level that they need to. So certainly that's a, a, a huge piece. If you, you know, one slide I took out, but the, the power of the crowd is that um, ships, small fishing vessels, uh, research vessels, they're getting outfitted with uh, basically data transmitters that can take their their sounding data and send it to the repository. So the, the power of the crowd and crowdsourcing is becoming more commonplace. And so if you're out on the water a lot and you want to contribute to the bathymetric grid of the Great Lakes, well, it's not that hard anymore. It's not that far off. Um, so there, there's all kinds of ways. But I think the awareness of the programming we have here and that we do a lot of great stuff, both, both with university partners, but what we do on our own in terms of creating some, some pretty powerful pathways. So when we first started, um, we had quite a few that came out of state, um, and then that slowly migrated to more in Michigan, um, and we're seeing more from the local community now, so that word is getting out. We still have a, a, a good national draw. We also see uh, a lot more women. When we first started, we had zero women in the program, and now we're about 25%. And everybody is hired and doing all the same things. So um, I'm not sure if we have a good metric of what exactly how our, our demographics are going to shift, but we see a national draw for sure. And I think that's probably one of the biggest opportunities for us is the is the national market. No one does what we do. Period. Yeah. Where do you find information on the repository? Where do you find it? So Great Lakes Observing System would be uh, Great Lake, uh, G -L -O -S, uh, dot org. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. My fishing husband and my fishing nephew think bathmetrics. To all of us in this room, carry forward the message this, that you've heard today to at least one person. Thanks, Josh, for asking that question. And I think what we've seen today is the power of collective impact and the fact that NMC has been a major convener and driver for all of this and how essential and important this work is to our economic future. So when we used to think about being blue, well, Am I blue? You bet. Uh, great twist on a new song, old song. Okay, Hans, please take with you these lovely cherry products as a small token of our appreciation for your presentation today. And uh, go forth, everyone. This is our last meeting for the calendar year. I know we'll miss you all. But we'll be back here full strength in January when our speaker will be... Ben Carson. Carlson. Carlson, excuse me. Uh, our January speaker is Ben Carlson. He has a uh, he's on CNBC, Bloomberg quite often, but he has a blog called A Wealth of Common Sense, and he's a Traverse City native. So um, look forward to hearing from him in January. Great, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.